your name when we do announce the questions if you want to remain anonymous. In terms of the slides and the recording from today's session, um, and first of all, I want to say way to go, you guys. It's a flurry of activity with everyone introducing themselves, so thank you. Um, so with everything going on today, um, we wanted to let you know also that the link to the video and slides will be out shortly. Um, my apologies that my video isn't working today. I have done multiple reboots on my computer trying to get it to work for today, but I'm sorry it's not working. I have a new computer sitting on my desk, which will be installed right after today's call. Um, the other thing is we have been actively on Twitter uh, for these sessions. And so the hashtags we've been using are it starts with me, um, which is uh, cultural safety uh, and it's cultural humility as well as another hashtag you can use. We've got two Twitter handles we can tap into for today. Um, and one of them is Dr. E online, which is Dr. Evan Adams, our presenter today's uh, Twitter handle, as well as FNHA's Twitter handle. So we welcome you to use those. I will be on Twitter as time permits, and we've got some comms folks that will be uh, tweeting up a storm during the call as well today. Um, wanted to remind people that the subject matter for today's session is sensitive. And we want to ensure that you have prepared support systems in advance for you as you, as you join today's call. Um, and this could mean an elder or a trusted friend. Uh, just wanted to make sure you've got that in place. If for any reason you do need some support, we are providing you with the 1-800 uh, crisis line number here, 1-800-588-8717. Um, or if you prepare, uh, prefer to have a local number that you can refer to to get going today. Um, it is with pleasure now I want to hand it over to our elder Virginia Peters. Uh, Virginia has joined us um, in the past for our webinar series and it's always a pleasure to have her here. So welcome Virginia. Uh, Virginia is an elder um, and she comes from Chehalis, BC. Her immediate family consists of three daughters, two sons, 11 grandchildren, six foster grandchildren, and 11 great-grandchildren. So she has a really large extended family. Um, definitely over 1,500 according to her bio, and her family is very close-knit. Um, we're very thrilled to have Virginia join us today um, and do our opening prayer. And I'm just hoping that your, audit, uh, your auditory line, is, your phone line is actually working, Virginia. I'll hand it over to you now. Virginia, are you able to get on the line? I know for the best of us, sometimes technical issues get to us. It doesn't look like Virginia's been able to dial in or get on video yet. Um, regret that she can't join us to do our opening prayer. And I'm just wondering if somebody on the line would be willing to do the opening prayer for us today to start off our call. Um, if you are so inclined and you'd be available to join us and do a brief opening prayer, uh, maybe just use the hand button and raise your hand and we'll unmute your line and invite you to do our opening prayer today. Ah, uh, thank you very much, Evan. I see your hand was shot right up. So I'm going to hand it over to you if you'd be so kind to do our opening prayer. And then I'll actually do a formal introduction of you as well. Please go ahead, Evan. Thank you, Creator, for bringing us all here today to, to uh, learn about cultural safety and humility. Um, we want to do the best for First Nations people. Um, we want them to, we want us everyone to feel safe in healthcare settings. And um, just thank you for this opportunity and we pray that the right things will be spoken and everything will be processed well and understood and that everything is done in a good way and that we all communicate well. Thank you, Creator. Amen. Thank, thank you, Nita. Thank you so much. <laughs> Evan, would you be so kind to acknowledge who just did our wonderful opening prayer? Yes, of course. Um, that was Anita Kristoff, who's one of the writers in my office and helped me very much today um, in getting my presentation ready. And uh, she, she was sitting beside me. And, uh, <laughs> wonderful. Well, 
I'll just introduce you before you get started. So thank you so much that she could join us to do our welcoming. And apologies to everyone in Virginia that we couldn't have you join us today. Um, it's a pleasure. I'd like to hand over the rest of the session now to Dr. Evan Adams. Um, Evan is the Chief Medical Officer with First Nations Health Authority. And if anyone has had the opportunity to hear him speak before, um, you'll know that you're in for a treat today. Uh, he never fails to be engaging. I'm always on the edge of my seat listening to every word he says. So it's a wonderful presentation and great to have you. Um, so Dr. Evan Adams is uh, from Salaaman First Nation Ancestry, and he serves as the uh, Chief Medical Officer for First Nations Health Authority. Um, he provides an incredible role around leadership representing First Nations Health Authority and works very closely with the government partners on population and public health matters that affect First Nations and all British Columbians. Um, prior to working with FNHA, um, Evan was appointed as the Deputy Provincial Health Officer and worked alongside the Provincial Health Officer, Perry Kendall. Um, as well as the Deputy Provincial Health, Health Officer, I can't talk today, Dr. Eric Young. So in this past role, he provided sort of independent direction on First Nations and Aboriginal health issues to the Ministry of Health. And he's also reported to citizens on health issues affecting the general population and setting a path for how we can really improve Indigenous health in the province. Um, so he, he completed his Doctor of Medicine at the University of Calgary, his Aboriginal Family Practice Residency at St. Paul's. He's always got some great stories from that time. And a Master's of Public Health as well, so quite an underachiever from Johns Hopkins University. Um, he also served as the Director of UBC's Division of Aboriginal People's Health. So uh, please join me, everyone, in welcoming Evan today. Um, please go ahead, Evan. I'm going to hand the ball over to you. Thank you so much, Colleen, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I feel um, a bit strange in that it's uh, just me and, and my computer, but I know that there are so many of you out there who are doing some tremendous work, first of all, and that you're spread out across the province, many of you um, in First Nations communities, uh, and that I know uh, many of you, and uh, I feel uh, quite happy about that, and I also feel uh, a bit humbled uh, in that I, I, there are probably many of you who could be speaking today, and, and uh, it, it is a... I feel quite lucky to share some thoughts with you. We, we have been collecting our thoughts here at the FNHA um, so that we um, can present something that is hopefully meaningful to you. And I've titled um, my presentation today, Intergenerational Trauma and Reconciliation in Healthcare. It's a slightly different title than um, was proposed um, when uh, Dr. Caron was going to co-present with me. Dr. Caron is um, a specialist position uh, in the north, and uh, she, does, she sees a lot of patients, which I don't do. I work in public health, looking after groups of people and not, um, and not individuals. So um, please forgive the last minute change, and we're really sorry that Dr. Caron um, isn't here. She's much better looking um, than me, and she, well, she's a much better speaker than me, <laughs> but, but I'm here. So I'm pleased to discuss um, intergenerational trauma, something I absolutely know a lot about. Both of my parents went to residential school. In fact, they met in residential school uh, and uh, married as soon as my mother finished uh, grade 12. I still have both my parents. They're um, 80 and 75 years old. They've been married for, gosh, almost 60 years now. And uh, uh, we talk about residential school now openly, though for a long time uh, we didn't. And uh, as a physician, when I was seeing patients for many years, would talk about um, intergenerational trauma, would talk about um, some of the things that have happened in people's lives as they try and integrate them, as they try and heal from them, as they try and um, uh, feel better about what's come to pass. Uh, I, like the, um, I like the saying, it's always a good time to heal. And uh, I'm hoping that today will, a lot, will be a lot about healing and about giving others the opportunity to heal uh, and to get better. And of course, I would like to talk about um, cultural safety and um, humility. I would like to talk a bit about um, the First Nations Health Authority, and I especially look forward to um, speaking with you at the end and hearing some of your thoughts. It's certainly my desire to um, be very conversational. I know a lot of you have stories and, and ideas that, I, that um, will be helpful to all of us. So. I will try not to hurry through my part of it so I can get to, I can get to that. <laughs> uh, so I, they have taught me how to advance the slide, and there it is. So what is trauma? Everyone knows what trauma is. It's a wound or an injury. 
But it's not just a physical wound or an injury. In fact, often First Nations people refer to trauma as being a psychic injury, and not just a small injury, but a very large scale um, injury. And I hope that um, many of you understand and recognize that the residential school system was a world-class psychic trauma perpetuated against um, some of our most vulnerable, um, against our children. Uh, and that trauma, uh, uh, never to be belittled, that trauma um, affected them and affects us, uh, us, their neighbors, us, their families, uh, and certainly us, their children. And as we talk about um, trauma as being uh, something that can be intergenerational. And I think the classic way that we see this uh, is in um, patient attitudes. When First Nations people um, meet with healthcare givers or healthcare workers, um, they are very much informed by their past. They're very much informed by their family's experiences. And they bring expectations. They bring beliefs. They bring disbeliefs. They bring trust or mistrust. Uh, they bring these past experiences to their um, therapeutic relationship today, uh, and it, it informs them. And it, it literally affects their minds, it affects their spirits, and it can affect their bodies. So intergenerational trauma, something that happens, say, to my parents in residential school, can affect how I interact with the healthcare system today, and it can change my body's outcomes. It can, I wear that intergenerational trauma in my body, and it can mean uh, a negative outcome uh, for my body. Um, or I can get better from previous trauma, uh, and I, I can heal. So how does that work? Well, um, intergenerational trauma is what happens when untreated uh, trauma-related stress experienced by survivors is passed on to subsequent um, generations. And residential schools is uh, a classic example of that. And the full scope of the damage that was done to that family or to that lineage um, takes a long time to manifest, and uh, we can see it. Um, in, uh, we can see it flower and grow and change um, and have an effect um, psychically, um, physically, and spiritually, even, as it were. Um, some people do good or do bad because of their um, family's experiences, uh, and it's continuing to manifest for a long time after the original um, event. And um, that this intergenerational um, trauma means that forces us to cope, forces us to cope with what's happened, and that some of that coping, uh, oh, I don't want to be judgmental, I don't want to say it's negative coping, Maybe it's coping that's not very effective. And then there's coping that can be quite effective. So for instance, if a residential school um, makes you feel like drinking, maybe that's not the best way to cope. Um, if your family's residential school experience means that you're hypervigilant and you are incredibly protective of your children, um, that might be, say, a more positive way uh, to cope. So British Columbia has the second highest number of residential school survivors um, in Canada. We have about 1,400, the second only to Ontario. And the reason I bring this up is because it means that um, uh, we have the second highest number of intergenerational survivors in um, Canada here in this province. There are a lot of us who are affected by uh, the hangover of this experience, and I still see it. Just this past weekend, um, I met with a family who was so mistrustful of institutions and the healthcare system that it very badly affected them. And uh, there really was a lot of mistrust in, in, in speaking to them. I had to do a lot of reassuring so that they would continue to participate and interact with people like me. And I think interacting with me is supposed to be a positive experience. And they weren't sure of that. And that was very much a result of their family's uh, residential school. So there are lots of intergenerational um, trauma survivors. So something that maybe some of us know very well is that um, uh, Canadian healthcare um, leaders and Canadians 
and Canadian leaders in general have um, seen us as an important priority. Uh, in 2016's uh, Great Canadian Healthcare Debate, um, looked at a few issues, but 73% of the delegates, the majority of delegates, voted for the adoption of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and naming Aboriginal health as a number one uh, priority uh, for them. This is not to be understated, because I've been in, uh, well, at least a few countries recently where Indigenous health does not make number one, does not make the top 10, does not make the top 100 issues um, for leaders in those countries. So we have a tremendous opportunity, and I know that perhaps the honeymoon is over for um, our federal leadership, but I still hold great hope personally uh, that there are many of us who are asking well, demanding that Indigenous health uh, be front and center uh, for our daily work. So ditto for the Federal Provincial Territorial Ministers of Health uh, in January of last year. You see uh, Federal Minister Jane Philpott and um, our Provincial Health Minister um, front and center here in this photograph. They named um, Indigenous health um, as an important issue. And in, in Indigenous health, it's not just the physical health of Indigenous people, it's about the health care system that supports those um, Indigenous people. And it means looking at issues like uh, prescription drug abuse, care in the community, health innovation, um, upstream health or health promotion and, and prevention, um, and um, local issues like, or person issues like uh, elder care, um, uh, traditional medicine, uh, and um, palliation. We're also informed by the <coughs> Truth and Reconciliation Commission's uh, health record. In the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission's calls to, call to action, uh, there were several that were um, health-related, uh, about seven or so, but about 18 of them, um, we feel, at the First Nations Health Authority um, are related to our, directly related to our work. So we've embraced um, the TRC's health recommendations and um, at least 18 of its um, calls to action um, to address health for our population. Um, people ask often, what is reconciliation? Well, reconciliation, from a medical perspective, is uh, making peace with what's come to pass. And it is surprising um, how difficult this can be. None of us grow up thinking, gosh, I'm looking forward to being injured. I'm looking forward to a setback. I'm looking forward to the time in my life where I suddenly have to go to emerge. I'm looking forward to those events um, that I had never dreamed could happen to my mind, body, and spirit happening to me, and I will need help. We often don't think of those but they happen. In fact, um, they're quite predictable. Um, I don't think any of us are going to get through um, life without some kind of setback or without needing assistance, needing real assistance, um, needing a healthcare professional um, who's extremely well-trained to deal with what has come to pass um, to each of us. So that's reconciliation, making peace with what has happened. However, reconciliation, as far as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and please remember the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was about recording human rights abuses against our children. Um, but um, the aftermath of the recording of um, those human rights abuses against our children was a commitment to talk about those abuses against our people uh, and to build a trusting relationship uh, with settlers. Um, settlers uh, building a relationship with us, us building a relationship with Canada, uh, and Canadians, uh, and uh, having a relationship that is respectful and of mutual benefit. So reconciliation is uh, easy to say, difficult to do, and um, probably something that we as First Nations people understand a lot better than other Canadians, because uh, we still have other Canadians saying, what is reconciliation again, or haven't we achieved it? And I have to say, my gosh, uh, we haven't even started. So <laughs> let's, uh, let, let's not be um, jaded, let's not be naive, let's um, not say we're already there. Uh, reconciliation is a tall order. 
on health care uh, and indigenous peoples is very much related to quality. Um, quality is one of those, again, a small word, but an incredibly large idea. Um, we want to grow the quality of healthcare services for us, for ourselves. So what does that mean? Well, um, quality, if we think of quality as quality assurance, or we want to meet a particular standard, maybe meet the standard of the uh, provincial healthcare system or of the federal health care system. Um, but maybe it's about quality improvement. Maybe we want to improve the quality of our services so that they match or better that of um, those available um, for other British Columbians. Uh, and maybe we want to change the quality of our services so that they're more reflective of our values. So, for instance, rather than um, building health institutions, we would say, well, health actually starts at home. What about health in the home, health in the family, as opposed to being focused on uh, a health system in Vancouver or um, a hospital that might be several kilometers away? Uh, what about health um, uh, in the walls of our homes and within um, our community? And quality is not just about um, us asking for change for ourselves. It's about asking for change at the highest level. It's about asking for change uh, for services uh, that are provincially run, like change of the province, and change that are federally run, or change in Ottawa, um, and change in our, um, in our health centers. Those are fair to ask for in our pursuit of quality uh, for First Nations health in D.C. Within quality, we would ask for those services to adapt to who we are. So rather than the system saying, oh, we just treat all British Columbians the same, that healthcare system should say, oh, I'm working in, say, Nanaimo. Nanaimo Nation is there. Um, maybe we should have some of our services reflect the fact that we recognize we're in Nanaimo territory and the Nanaimo people speak a certain language and they're greeted in a particular way. We respect them when they come in instead of, and we're happy to see them when they come in, and we treat them like our cousins instead of saying, oh, no, here comes another Indian into our beautiful healthcare um, facility. So cultural safety and humility is, again, an ask of the system to adapt, and it's also um, um, ask for um, a, a change in the power dynamic between the caregiver um, and the client or the patient um, and ask for uh, a respectful and open uh, clinical encounter every single time. It demands that of the, of the worker and the patient uh, that they have an open and respectful interaction, not just any old, any old interaction that the doctor or the nurse or the healthcare worker are just giving out whatever attitude they have um, for that day no, the standard is um, that uh, we treat each other well and we give each other our best every time. So cultural safety and humility as far as healthcare workers, and remember um, all of the 100,000 healthcare workers in the province have agreed to cultural safety and humility um, that it starts with me, um, that we wish to create a culture of change for better health services for First Nations and Aboriginal people. And I, I really hope that of anything that I say today that you'll remember this, that we are trying to create a culture of change for better health services for First Nations and Aboriginal people. And I will ask you, I will call you to action at the end of my presentation. I will ask you, how can you create a culture of change for better health services for you yourself for First Nations um, and Aboriginal people? Um, as a physician, I, um, I often use them as an example uh, of healthcare workers who are out there. So one of the ideas um, that I wanted to present was around culturally safe um, physicians. And this is something that I've talked about with other physicians. This is something I've talked about with physician organizations. And the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons uh, of Canada has um, given a lot of thought to culturally safe positions uh, in Canada. And uh, so they present some ideas around culturally safe interventions um, through their CanMed 
um, cultural safety consent assessment. So if you um, if you go to the Royal College site um, and you enter cultural safety, find some of their documents around culturally safe positions. But it's really not um, brain surgery. It really is around fostering an understanding of indigenous health values and to model these behaviors um, as part of their clinical behavior. So that we as physicians um, would model indigenous health values. So um, that to me being, means being humble, respectful, um, open, kind, um, and not usual kind of doctor-like behavior um, we think of for ourselves. And some of that, some of that um, physician behavior is, um, is often not helpful when we're just um, too, too, um, too cool for school, where we think we're too smart. Um, sometimes we're too much uh, in a hurry. Sometimes we over-medicalize and we say things like, oh, let me treat your intergenerational trauma with a, um, with a pill. Instead, we might uh, recommend um, some other form of therapy. But we practice critical thinking and self-reflection to nourish cultural safety. Um, and um, self-reflection, we often hear about cultural safety and self-reflection. As a caregiver, self-reflect. We say things like, oh, I'm the doctor and the nurse, and I have a particular job to do here in this room with this first nation patient. But they're the star of the show. Um, they're the ones who's not well. So even if I want to do a blood pressure right now, maybe they want to talk about, um, say, the, the, the creator has something in store for me. Uh, and um, the, I think cultural humility is very much about being other-focused, not being self-reflective, but other-focused. So if I'm truly, as a, pre as a healthcare worker, um, have, if I truly have cultural humility, I am focused, I am other-focused, I am patient-focused, and not focused on myself. Um, I can also have um, knowledge and attitudes as a culturally safe physician. I can understand the unique, unique historical legacies and intergenerational traumas affecting indigenous people and their health. So um, I should know a thing or two about the local residential school. I should know a thing or two about communicable diseases that have happened um, to the, the local people. Uh, and I should know a thing or two about the families near, near me and their health risks. I should know um, somewhat um, who's in trouble and who needs help. I should learn to dialogue um, rather than to interrogate, um, as in uh, uh, I should be able to listen <laughs> better than I was taught as a doctor. If you can imagine, uh, and I, I often relate this story, um, in, when I was being trained as a physician, we were trained to not interrupt the patient, to let them speak for 40 seconds before we interrupt them. We actually had to be trained to last 40 seconds in our listening. Can you imagine? 40 seconds is not very long. And we had to be forced to, to allow a person to speak for that long before we um, um, started to dialogue um, with them. Uh, and uh, we're meant to look at some um, uh, at-risk populations or you know, what are the particular um, things that are going on for you. So culturally safe physicians, here's a, um, I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, I think it's a, a bit self-explanatory. We, we ask a physician to um, uh, consider their um, cult, cult, consider a cultural safety in their different kinds of interventions that they have. Um, here's, a, um, uh, um, here's the 2013 report by the Royal College. It's a, it's a gold mine for um, students or for those of you who are engaged in lifelong learning in your healthcare work um, uh, around um, cultural safety and humility concrete ideas. And if you're looking for um, approaches to trauma-informed practice, um, there is a trauma-informed practice guide um, that I had a very tiny role in and that maybe some of you had quite large roles in because I know that this trauma-informed practice guide was the result of quite a long process of talking to workers about 
how do you change um, trauma-informed principles or acknowledging that um, often patients have stories of trauma that inform their being and change that into clinical practice? How do we interact with people with trauma so that we're more effective? How do we take the opportunity um, to heal with the patient? So those are um, two good um, pieces for you to look at. So primary health care themes from community engagement. Um, I want to talk about um, primary health care because we've been talking about health in general, but primary health care is a part of the system that is the first point of interaction for um, you as clients or patients or for indigenous people who are engaging with the healthcare system. And um, there are certain few principles um, that we should have um, in primary healthcare or as primary healthcare workers or as healthcare workers. So for instance, at the top right corner, you see accessible. So there shouldn't just be a primary healthcare center in Ottawa or Vancouver that all of you travel to to get care. Um, care should be much more uh, accessible than that. Uh, for Indigenous people, um, uh, it should be wellness focused. So we shouldn't be engaging with the healthcare system when we're um, five minutes from death or when something really bad has already happened. Um, we should be talking about um, wellness um, constantly, continuously, and we should be having uh, using the opportunity to talk about wellness um, whenever someone is engaging with the system. So uh, just to tell, relate a story on that, um, recently someone came to me looking for help for a healthcare problem that they'd had for years. And I thought, well, why are you interrupting my Christmas holidays to talk about your health and well-being now? Um, you know, you've been doing this for years. And I realized the opportunity was today. The opportunity wasn't yesterday. It wasn't many years ago when their health issue started. And I may not have that chance again tomorrow. It's today. So the opportunity is now. And so um, I must stop um, and listen. And uh, uh, last of all, I'm just going to touch upon uh, multidisciplinarity because we want um, interdisciplinary teams in our communities, workers with all kinds of skills, not just doctors and or nurses. For instance, we may want uh, culturally-based workers. We, we may want traditional practitioners. We may want people who have um, um, skills that are more related to wellness than acuity. And uh, last of all, to be person and community-centered, that we're focused not just on the healthcare system, um, we're completely focused on the patient. Recently, I was in Ottawa, and we were talking about the opioid crisis, and we had some very, very high-level workers there. <laughs> People were saying the elephant in the room is, you know, this opioid issue. How do we talk about opioid issues, quite frankly? And I said, oh, um, is the elephant even here? Everyone's talking about the elephant, but the elephants in the room are people who see opioids as an issue. So where are people with the lived experience? So they were calling people affected by opioids as the elephant. They were calling them um, as people with lived experience, really, um, they're the star of the show. Uh, and we were just talking about them. So it was funny to have a gathering um, that didn't include elephants and didn't include people with lived experience. It only included the workers. And so um, you can see how person and community-centered um, needs to be um, highlighted here. So I want to talk to you now about um, the LEARN model, listen, explain, acknowledge, recommend, negotiate. So these are some clinical skills um, or action, taking action around reconciliation that you can use um, in your therapeutic encounters, in, in your therapeutic relationship. So let's talk about these. So listen, explain, acknowledge, recommend, negotiate, or LEARN. Uh, are some ideas that um, were developed um, in part in the South Bay area in San Jose, California, but that we use um, here at the First Nations um, Health Authority and that we um, recommend using for um, indigenous workers who are in the field. Um, we also recommend this to um, healthcare workers who wish to be 
um, culturally safe. These, so um, I explained earlier how um, listening better and being other focused or patient focused, hearing the patient voice um, can be helpful to you. Um, and to explain, uh, to explain is also um, called a dialogue. <laughs> As an actor, we would learn how to monologue, to talk all by ourselves, just one person talking, everyone else listening. But we also learned how to dialogue. And for most people, a dialogue is way more interesting than a monologue. And so if a physician is monologuing to you, like I am now, uh, that's way less interesting than dialoguing. And so uh, 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 in being patient-focused, I would expect to dialogue, not to monologue. And so uh, an explanation of what I'm doing and then waiting for feedback is um, a way that we should all be working. Third of all is to acknowledge. Acknowledgement of the patient's um, experience and the patient's thought. So uh, once I was helping a residential school survivor understand a pulse of steroids that I was going to put them on to calm down a flare that they were having. And I said, this, um, pulse, this pulse of steroids needs a different dose every day, um, increasing then de decreasing um, over a certain period of time with some other follow-up steps. It's complicated. Do you want me to write this down for you? And they said, you think I'm stupid? And uh, I had to acknowledge, stop and acknowledge why do you feel like I might think that you're stupid? I, I really didn't think he was stupid. I knew it was complicated. Why would you think I was calling you stupid? And he went on to explain that um, his experience of the system was to say back to him, you're stupid. Uh, and that was, uh, and so I acknowledged that. I said, I'm very sorry that ever happened to you. Uh, I will absolutely do my best to not have you feel that way. I really want you to be well. I really want you to, to understand this pulse of steroids. Um, let's find a way to make it work for you and for you not to feel bad and not follow. Um, because if he felt bad, he wasn't going to follow my instructions. Um, to recommend, as in we put forward a treatment plan, we make a plan together. If we don't make a plan when I visit, um, I almost feel like we didn't visit. So the plan is important. So um, I need to put forward a recommendation to you and have that be understood, and then to negotiate that, that we then talk about um, how does the patient engage with that. So if you have pneumonia and uh, I want to give you antibiotics, but you don't believe in me, then, then I fail. I, um, the patient will not take um, these very magical antibiotics. Um, I need to speak to them about um, my recommendation and say, is this good with you? How are you feeling about this? I'm going to skip this slide for sake of time. So change ideas and other resources are found um, at www.fnha.ca. Um, if you um, look for um, cultural safety um, and humility, you will find some key drivers and ideas for change. And I just wanted to remind us that as um, uh, healthcare workers, in acknowledging the otherness of the people that we're working with, that um, we must be able to engage with them around uh, discussions of wellness and the First Nations perspective on health and wellness. And that can often mean that, for instance, with intergenerational survivors, that um, they may not have just physical symptoms, but spiritual symptoms, um, emotional symptoms, and mental symptoms. They may have thoughts and expectations um, that need to be heard, uh, acknowledged, um, and, and treated or, or, or dealt with. Uh, and that um, these uh, constellations around uh, First Nations perspective of uh, health and wellness are, um, are a lot, but we can tackle them. So, so for instance, uh, uh, in my therapeutic uh, relationships, I'm not just focused on the human being at the center. Uh, I feel able and ready, and I expect 
um, to talk to them about their feelings about their family. For instance, they may say, gosh, after all this, I need to speak to my sister. Or they may say something like, you know what I really need? I need to go back on the land. You know what I need? I need ceremony. You know what I need? I need my, for my community to step it up and to help me. And, uh, and I'm ready for all of those conversations. I'm not um, befuddled uh, by them. And I hope that um, you, as workers, um, are ready for, um, for those kinds of holistic approaches as well. I'm going to stop now because uh, I really want to get to the Q&A. And I'm going to send the ball back to Tom so that he can um, moderate the discussion um, between all of us. Because I don't really know how to lead a Q&A um, <laughs> over the Internet. Thank you. Delighted. Thanks for handing the ball back to me, Evan, and thank you for sharing your thoughts. You know, I've been watching Twitter and, and following Twitter as we go through your session today, and there's been lots of um, response to your session and, and some really good food for thought in terms of thinking about, you know, the role physicians can play in modeling cultural safe behavior, um, how health services really need to reflect the needs of the people. You've raised some really good points. Um, Right now, what we have for the questions is uh, all the lines are currently muted. So I'd like to invite people to put their questions in the chat box, and we will read your question out to Dr. Evan Adams. Um, how, alternatively, if you prefer, you can raise your hand. Um, and there's a hand button just below, and it, it'll show up next to your name. And at that time, we can unmute your line to allow you to ask the question that way. So we've got two options for questions. You can throw them into the chat box for Evan, or you can just raise your hand and we will unmute your line. All right, we got our first question coming in. Um, so this is a question from Dallas Putlas, and she says, working in a pharmacy for 13 years as an assistant, the biggest complaint I heard from health professionals was, this is our tax dollars. Oh, okay, when dealing with First Nations, how do you address that? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> uh, my first reaction is to answer it the way my, my grandmother would answer that, is um, she would say, are you in charge of that? Because if you're not in charge of that, that's none of your business. <laughs> so um, people commenting on how tax dollars are spent is odd to me because, well, why are you complaining? You can't change that. Um, I mean, unless, of course, uh, um, you are in charge of federal spending or provincial spending. And, uh, and we uh, at the First Nations Health Authority um, and with the First Nations Health Council pride ourselves on the fact that we can, we can um, affect how spending occurs. Uh, and uh, I think this taxation question is part of um, a fallacy that many British Columbians and Canadians have that we have too much, um, too much money spent on us. And in fact, I had a doctor, a very senior doctor, say this to me recently at a physician's meeting. She said, I don't know why unions get everything. Um, you know, refugees need some help too. And I had to say to her, uh, how is it that First Nations people come in last in everything? and we're the poorest ethnic group in the country, even in our own land. Uh, but you're saying we have everything. You can't have it both ways. Do we have everything or do we have nothing? And she, she stopped talking because it is a fallacy that we have too much. We, in fact, have not enough. Thank you so much, Evan. Um, Maddie, would you be so kind to unmute Helga Vila's line? Um, she's got a question as well. And I'll try to get all the people with their hands up. There's a few hands up as well. And, and Chief Terry PG can go right after that if you can unmute that line. Thank you very much for your pre presentation, Evan. I have a question. It's kind of a technical question. Um, we do at Island Health a lot of mapping around trying to improve processes, both in the community and the acute sector. 
and uh, you know, to date we've been able to include, you know, patients in that, but something that I've been stumbling with is how do we reach out to the First Nations community to have that voice in there because we don't, uh, we don't do that. We, we, we look at the frail elderly, we, tr we try to, um, you know, cultivate the voice of our, 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 our patients, but we, we stumble with reaching out to the First Nations. Um, interesting. I, uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge that it, that it is hard because there are many First Nations, 203 First Nations um, in the province. Uh, on, on the other hand, um, we take great pride in the fact that um, we try and be conversant with First Nations. So um, we're trying to do what you're trying to do, and I think we have a few lessons. Now, we're different in that the First Nations Health Authority is a First Nations Health Authority for First Nations people by First Nations people. We are governed by the chief, so really we work we work for individual First Nations, uh, and we engage with them through our regional processes. So we don't we don't visit them one by one by one. Um, we hear the thoughts and feelings uh, uh, of uh, communities or First Nations through regional processes, and uh, so your regional director and their regional staff from the FNHA should be able should be able to connect you to. Uh, a First Nations voice, as it were. That being said, we don't interfere with um, First Nations relationships. We're not trying to replace a, a chief or an individual First Nations right to speak for themselves. Uh, and we do encourage individual relationships between, say, a hospital and a First Nations community or um, you know, some such uh, other uh, conglomeration of, of staff from here and um, First Nations people from there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evan. The questions are pouring in faster than we can answer them all, I think. I'm going to hand it over now to uh, Chief Terry TG to ask his question, then we'll go back to some of the chat box questions next. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Evan. Um, I'm just uh, curious as to a uh, great presentation. Um, my question is for healthcare in urban areas such as Prince George. We have a lot of First Nations that go to the clinics and to the hospitals. And there's, I've received many complaints here at the Tribal Council and, um, you know, not even only our membership, but other memberships from different uh, communities that the, the attitude towards First Nations is very racist, uh, as you've uh, noted in, in some of your presentation. But how do you deal with the changing the mindset of care practitioners that are non-Aboriginal? Uh, and uh, also, too, what, how can you create that, uh, that change that attitude of, of doctors and care practitioners in, in urban areas? Thank you. Thanks. Great to see you. And uh, excellent question. Uh, it really is hard to change people's behaviors, and uh, I, I'm not sure why, because I find change very, very exciting. But some people really love that as quo. Um, I think uh, the, the most highly trained and highest paid healthcare workers are doctors. So let me use them as an example of how do you change their attitude. So if a physician is um, racist, if a physician um, can't change their attitude or improve the quality of their service, there are, um, I think, some really quick and dirty ways, sorry for the, the expression, there are some quick ways to get to them. One of them is a complaint system. We should be allowed to complain about the care that we receive, to give feedback, mm -hmm. and, and um, not just give feedback, but to dialogue. So how do we talk about, say, um, doctors who give terrible care to indigenous people? Uh, and one way is to file a complaint. That complaint system lies with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of BC. They would receive your complaint, it's, uh, you write it out, and they are forced to then investigate what that physician is up to. Um, physicians are licensed by the College of Physicians and Surgeons, so they sit up straight when someone says, uh, what happened that day? Uh, what is the basis of this complaint? A second way is who pays doctors. And doctors are paid by regional health authorities. So uh, we can speak to regional health authorities about how are your doctors doing? Uh, what are they doing? How do we have input on their attitudes, their skills, uh, uh, complaints, 
and uh, how do we affect um, how they interact with our clients. And they're helping us uh, to do that. Now, with other healthcare workers, I, I think um, it's the same principle. Who pays them? That's who you go to, to um, demand change. Uh, and uh, second of all, uh, what is their standard of practice? Because the standard of practice in Canada and British Columbia is that you, as a public worker, as a healthcare worker, serve all populations. You serve everyone, not just the ones you like, not just the ones um, that you're good at. Um, you have to serve everyone. That's the expectation, or you go. Um, you go for retraining, or you dismiss, you're dismissed, and you find uh, another profession where you can, what we call cherry pick, uh, who you care for. And uh, good luck to you. So um, it's a pretty hard line, but it's really just the only way to go. Otherwise, the change is too slow. And I, I remember um, being in many, many hospital situations, going directly to the chief of staff and saying, um, this worker um, did a really bad thing, and we're going to talk about it. Gosh, that Thank sounds you. really strange, but it's not. Thank you. Yeah, it's a standard, right? It's a standard. <laughs> Thank you so much, Evan, and that's a very good question, and, and I think really worthy spending some time discussing. Um, the questions, there's so many here. I'm so glad you allowed some time, Evan, so I'm going to try and get through them all. Um, thanks to everyone for your patience as we work our way through here. The first one is, came from Sheila L. And, and how do we navigate, in terms of creating a space for conversations, uh, dialogue, getting to know people, how do we navigate the time constraints that physicians experience? It was one of the questions that came in from Sheila. Uh, the time constraints. I, I, I think um, physicians are not the only answer, honestly. I think, uh, I think we are over-dependent, we over-medicalize some of the issues um, that are being put in front of us. And I think the answer is teamless or multidisciplinary teams. So there, there are others besides physicians who can do really, really great work. So uh, I, I, I think a lot of communities largely look after themselves. I think there are local workers um, who are maybe even paraprofessionals um, or traditionally based workers who can do the work of physicians. Uh, we, um, we just need to give them opportunity and a platform and a structure um, so that they can, they can help out. I don't think the solution is um, you know, training more doctors, for instance. Uh, another way is to perhaps organize a system so that physicians um, see patients uh, in a, within a better structure. We all hate that seven and a half minute appointment uh, we all hate um, not being uh, geographically accessible to rural patients. Um, we would like to do better. So if the system can help us see more patients that are rurally or for a longer period of time, we would embrace that too. We're trying to be oh. brief. <laughs> and no, more. it's a <laughs> it's very useful, and I think that exploring those different care delivery models is interesting. Another question relating to physicians, though, that came in was from Terry Lee. Uh, Millie kindly posted the question. Is our physicians trained on Indigenous cultural safety? Does that training happen in school and other forums? Um, indigenous uh, cultural safety and humility is um, taught to medical students or you know, to doctors in training. Uh, it is not a requirement of physicians in practice in BC. It's recommended to international medical graduates, physicians from other countries who are coming here to work and need to do some additional training in order to qualify for a licensure here. Um, so uh, yes, we are starting to impress upon physicians that they need to have indigenous cultural competency or indigenous cultural safety and humility training in order to work in this province. And we were quite inspired by uh, the Maori in New Zealand. The Maori and the Maori health organizations directly hire doctors. So they hire and fire the right doctors for their people. And we said, yeah, we can do that. We can have an influence over physician behavior so that they're more responsive to our population. And, uh, I think we're learning to have more and more and more effect on them. Uh, uh, physicians largely uh, consider themselves independent, and they consider themselves independent contractors. They don't have a boss, but um, we think they're accountable. You know, they're paid by public funds. Um, they, if they um, underserve us, then I think those um, that morbidity and mortality is on their heads. And I certainly take every response, uh, every 
opportunity to remind them of that. Um, you have a responsibility to everyone, to all of us. Thank you so much. And I'm going to apologize right now. It doesn't look like we're going to get to all the questions coming in, Evan. Um, I'm going to go to this one because the next one's a little bit similar. So, but this one is, what are your thoughts on post-traumatic stress disorder uh, becoming an intergenerational trauma, um, i.e. veterans, those living with schizophrenia, bipolar, et cetera? Do you think this is potentially along the same line as with residential schools? Oh, uh, uh, well, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is an anxiety disorder and which is the sequelae of a, a, a traumatic event, usually you know, a catastrophic traumatic event, um, that's hard to integrate is exactly um, what almost everyone who went to residential school experiences. Um, uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder is a feeling of uh, hyperarousal um, from an event that happened long ago that can be triggered again. So you're feeling those feelings again, you're seeing those pictures again, um, and they're out of your control. Uh, and so you could almost say that that PTSD from a traumatic event like residential school it's a disease of memory, or it's a disease of spirit. It's something that's haunting you, and, uh, and you need to find a cure for it. So, so absolutely, PTSD, the residential school experience, and those um, experiences being handed down through generations are absolutely connected. You can pass your anxiety, and remember, trauma is an anxious condition. You can pass trauma and anxiety to your children. You can teach them here. You can, teach them, you can teach them disease of the spirit. You can teach them uh, people are bad. Uh, people will do bad things to you given the opportunity. You can teach them all of that. You can pass it on for sure. It's, it's contagious. It's, we can make it hereditary. So we must heal from it. We must learn to integrate traumatic events. We have to talk about them. Um, well, maybe not. We don't have to talk about them. We have to make them more conscious for sure. Thank you so much, Evan. Just one last question, and again, my apologies to everyone for not getting through the full list of questions. There's a full chat box of them, but I think on a, on a positive note, Evan, how do you stay strong when this topic has the ability to wear one down? Um, so Jen asked, how do we keep moving forward while keeping our heads up? Um, I'm going to tell you a sad story, kind of. Um, when you're on a ward with sick children, that for me is the standard. If you're around really, really sick kids, and some of them even close to death, that's horrendous. And that being your daily work, that for me is the standard. So when, uh, when I have to, once in a while, talk about an event that happened long ago that's still affecting people and still costing them, I, I can deal. And, uh, and I, I do think um, resilience is a traditional value. My dad always said, toughen up. You can withstand hunger. You can withstand deprivation. You can withstand um, someone being mean to you. Like, straighten up. And it, and it wasn't, he wasn't being mean. He said that's just how we are. And so I, I do think we need to learn how to do it. And, I, and uh, Chief Lydia Whitson said to me recently, she said, I just try not to feel it. It's my job to keep going. I can't get hurt because someone, you know, someone said something terrible to me or something bad happened. I have to keep going. And so I wish that for all of you. I wish you resilience, and I wish you a traditional resilience, and I wish for you not to feel everything that, that comes your way. <laughs> Thank you so much, Evan. I really appreciate you ending it on that note. Um, and you, did you want to reiterate your call to action just before we wrap up the session today in terms of what you're inviting people to do between now and our next webinar? Sure. So I'm inviting all of you to take action um, from what I presented uh, uh, about how you can take a strategy in, say, the coming um, days um, or months to address the health gap. What can you do to improve um, indigenous health? And I, uh, I hope you'll make a, a good solid commitment in your heart, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, Colleen, if you want that submitted to you, but um, I, I do absolutely believe that we, we must take this opportunity we had today um, to uh, pledge further action. Love it. Actually, what we'd love people to do is if you join us for our next webinar, perhaps you can pop your action in the chat box. Um, we can create space for that for people. I just want to draw attention. There was a question about terminology, about cultural safety, cultural humility. Um, Melanie from FNHA has kindly popped a link up into the chat box for people to see. Um, just before we wrap up, I want to thank Evan from the bottom of my heart for this amazing presentation, compelling discussion, and great questions from everyone on the phone today. 
remind people we have another webinar coming up already um, on February 1st. Uh, this time we'll be joined um, by the Fraser Health Aboriginal Health Team, and they're going to discuss some of the work they've been doing to um, address the challenges and success of, uh, successes of unearthing some of the biases in the healthcare system through their Indigenous Cultural Safety Debrief Circle sessions. So they're using these talking circles to, to kind of really explore personal and professional journeys of self-discovery to uh, unearth bias. And it, when we talk about how you actually make some of these changes, this is a really good session to build on um, the amazing food for thought that Evan's given us today. Um, so we hope you can join us next month. Um, before we wrap up, um, just a reminder, when you close down your browser today, you will get a survey. Please take the time to complete the survey. We really do look at every single survey result, um, and we're watching them to kind of help inform these sessions. And I'm just going to wrap it up today again and say thank you again, Evan, for joining us. It was a fantastic session, and thank you, everyone, for taking the time to be here. Good luck, everyone. Bye-bye. Good luck. The slides and the webinar recording will be posted, um, so watch for that information to come. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day.